Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Just to follow up for some of the content we covered on Monday, I'm showing you here a map by the satellite called Sentinel-5. And what we're looking at here is the sulfur dioxide concentrations from uh, the Tonga volcano eruption. And so what we saw throughout this week uh, here through the 18th was that the sulfur dioxide plume had moved over much of Australia. Now again, at this point, we have not yet been able to measure a significant enough kind of injection of sulfur dioxide deep into the stratosphere such that it is going to spread uh, you know, globally and potentially have a, pro a cause a problem with the next maybe 12 to 18 months in terms of temperatures. So that's just kind of a follow-up um, from what we covered last time. Now, just to show you something here, where we're located, you know, on the planets of the equators, right in through here. So we're in those trade winds. So you can actually see how the smoke plume actually throughout the depth of the of the lower atmosphere, uh, excuse me, the sulfur dioxide plume did move uh, to the east. And I want to talk to you for a moment about those trade winds because right now, the behavior is quite interesting over the next 15 days. And because of this, the MJO is going to have a, a relatively weaker signal pointing toward where this pattern is going, which means I think you're going to see a stronger signal coming out of the North Pacific jet stream. It will be connected with what I'm about to share with you, but I believe that the polar jet and what it's doing over the Gulf of Alaska is the most kind of important factor as we go forward. So what do we have here? When we're looking out over the next 15 days, we do start to see a kind of a resurgence of some stronger trade winds in that same area. So this is what often happens as a La Nina begins to kind of collapse, slowly collapse, is that you occasionally get these, um, you know, more La Nina-ish behaviors in the winds. And we're going to be seeing those stronger winds coming, you know, in this particular vicinity in the time moving forward. Now, why that's important is that's on the tail end of this side of the La Nina, where we've already started to see some warming. And our La Nina certainly has kind of backed itself up where we have still the greatest cooling uh, of the ocean temperatures over uh, in this side of um, the Pacific Nina region, one plus two and three. And even as of late, the temperatures here have kind of cooled back off and we expected to see this. But what's happening overall with this is that this particular feature tends to reinforce ridging in the jet stream over the Gulf of Alaska. What's competing against that is the cold water that's still in place here. And what we want to ask ourselves is, is the solution we're about to see, which is a pretty sizable pattern change going into February, uh, robust? So what have we seen so far? Well, from December's warmth to January's much colder weather, the month to date temperature ranks by climate district clearly show the presence of that colder air. Many of us across the eastern two thirds of the country are feeling the, the wave of Arctic air coming in on that big Arctic high uh, that's going and spreading all the way to the Gulf of Mexico and to the east where it's going to be causing some major problems here uh, in the next 12 to 24 hours uh, along the Carolina coast. But I want to come back to this longer term discussion by showing you where we've been in terms of precipitation. And my ongoing concern about the spreading of the drought in the Southern Plains and even in times into the lower Mississippi River Valley, that's going to continue to be there until I see something shift up to where we can get some subtropical flow in here or just start to invigorate systems back farther to the West. Now, in this part of Texas and along the Gulf Coast, there is some good news in the near term. Because of the depth of the trough setting up here over the next seven to 10 days, we're going to get a lot of um, upper level support to develop low pressure systems along. In other words, the trough will dig in and kick the air out ahead of it, giving us low pressure development. But after that, we're going to see a bit of a shift in the pattern. It's going to take that activity right back up over the Mid-South in the Ohio River Valley. Now, where have we been? I think this is quite instructive to take a look at where we've what we've seen in terms of the height pattern through January. We've seen a ridge set up here over the West, and that's why much of the West has been drier, especially California throughout the month of January. So it's good that we got that really good snowpack built up in December to kind of survive this drier time period here in January. What is also interesting is that the models really forecasted this trough well, but I believe they under forecast this one. And why that's important in this forecast is because that's where that cold water is. So we're kind of sensibly cooling the atmosphere here and the heights are lowering because of it. Now why I bring this, this all up is because we're about to see a shift in this pattern where this ridge is going to start to back itself up to the west with time and redevelop here or maybe even as far west as the Aleutian Islands. And as I stated, when we have a La Nina, especially one that's east focused, it tends to promote more ridging here. What I want to know is, does that ridge get influenced at all by this cold water like it has been so far this month? So we need to kind of stitch all that together and just think about where it's going. And I think the best way to do that is to just get an idea 
on some model agreement at first. So I'm going to show you the GFS ensemble. Through this week and all the way into next week, we're going to continue to see more ridging in the west. There'll be northwest flow in the central United States and troughing over the east. So the activity means systems will show up here and they'll run along the Gulf Coast around the base of this trough and then move up the east coast. In the middle, there's a lot of convergent flow, so there's drier air into this region. And should systems form in Alberta, they kind of follow the flow and we get a lot of clippers. This also gives us good lake effect snow, but there's a lot of warmth in the west. Now watch, this is a week from now essentially, and as we play out fully into week two, look at the pattern start to shift by the 30th and 31st, then getting into the very beginning of February. In fact, we'll just stop it here on Groundhog's Day about the time we get the Groundhog's opinion. And what we've seen at this time is the pattern going back to a ridge near the Gulf of Alaska, here near the Aleutian Islands, possibly a low that's over uh, Hawaii, so there's split flow. And things kind of come together to dig a trough into the Intermountain West. And if this ridge here sets up and at times is established over the Eastern Canadian Maritimes or maybe even over the Southeast, this just sets up this section of the United States to have a lot of activity. Plus we get clippers out of this pattern as well. This returns more snow to the mountains. But California without a subtropical jet will likely continue to be on the drier side of things. Now the question is, I, I mentioned the connection to La Nina, but is the MJO in agreement? Well, the latest forecast has got this right now in null space. That's why it was such a mess that you saw at the beginning when I showed you the trade wind field. It's hard to pick out where we have the most dominant rising motion, but it appears that it's going to try to come back out again into phases six and seven. And if it spends some time in phase seven to finish up January and to get into February, I want to show you what that historically means. And I'll come back to that same discussion we've had now for a few weeks. This ridge here and its placement is going to be critical to setting up the pattern for the rest of North America. All right. And phase seven in January, and you've seen this figure a lot if you're watching my content. We know that we tend to get that ridge in place. Yes, it's drier along the coast, but systems kind of dig around this trough, plenty of clippers, and that's what we get. Now watch. When you go into February, this is what the correlation looks like. And that at first may seem quite a lot different, but let me, let me make an illustration here for you. That ridge is still in place. And just as we showed, we tend to get ridging here and there as well. Remember I was kind of looking at that here? You see we're watching this and this and down here to see if we get those higher heights. Because what that means is systems will come around and run over the top of it and then eject out into the northeast. Now the farther west this goes, the better the precipitation will be for the west. But let's just see what the models are explaining to us right now. So here's the brand new European weeklies. We're going to look again at the month of February. And here's what the trend has been. This area has gotten larger and wetter in terms of the wet anomalies. In other words, much more active track through here. We've continued to see from the Canadian prairie into this side of the western mountains better snows, which means more systems rolling down like this or clippers coming out and heading over the Great Lakes. Where we've seen drying is here. And earlier simulations suggested that we would get better flow coming in like this around the trough because the ridge was backing up more. And now the models kind of backed away on that. So that snowpack we got in December is going to have to carry us through part of February, maybe most of February as well. And it's good. We're sitting a good snowpack, but we've got to have more as we get into March, which means we'll need to be talking about the chances for a miracle March in the West. So that's it. This is what I've got for the long range. And the temperatures, as you can imagine, kind of respond in kind. We still get this setup where there's plenty of cold air out of the Canadian prairie. But we're going to start to see more mild days showing up here, unlike what we've got to finish January, all because the trough is forecast to back up to the west. All right. So from there, what are we dealing with in the near term? Well, there's this Arctic front that's sitting right in through here, and that's a big area of high pressure. Clear skies, light winds, and temps are going to bottom out here again tonight. I'll show them to you in a few moments. But the shallow Arctic air mass undercuts some warmer air aloft. And the risk here is that we're going to get some ice developing in eastern North Carolina. So we can already see the snow in the overnight on the northern side of it. But watch the pink start to show up in this area. National Weather Service has been uh, issuing ice storm warnings, and they've also issued winter storm warnings out for this part of North Carolina. Because throughout the day tomorrow, see how the pink in the model? That just indicates where the model precipitation type could be ice. Now, what you've also noticed is that there's another system. It's off the map, but it's going toward the Hudson Bay. It's dragging a front through here. So we're going to get some light snow here in the northern plains into the upper Midwest. 
There's going to be some decent snow showers coming through the Rockies, and they're even going to get out here into the, uh, into the plains of Colorado as well. And as we play that on forward, this is now getting through early Saturday morning. One front clears, the clipper rolls on through. We get some good lake effect snow out of that one. See the lake effect snow band? And there's another weak clipper that just quickly comes down here on Saturday, bringing another chance of some light snow. So our good high resolution models here picking up on a lot of this. I do wanna take you back and show you that ice chance though. This is the probability just uh, here through the next, uh, really through the next 24 hours of picking up ice. So we can see that in this region, we're looking at a, a chance uh, better than 80% at picking up ice, right? Especially right in through here, ice more than a tenth of an inch. And on the northern side of it, we could be getting snow here and possibly up the coast a little farther as well. Now to see all that, I'd like to flip over to the European model and the GFS, but I want to remind you of something we talked about on Monday. The GFS performance really fell off, and that's why we preferred the European as of late. But take a look. Got a little bit of a rebound here. So when matching the height pattern, both models are actually kind of sitting pretty darn close to one another. What's interesting about that is that the model forecasts kind of respond to that. So take a look. We've already seen the next couple of days looking at the high res NAM. And you can see here that through 6 p.m. on Friday, then working our way into Saturday morning, models are pretty consistent, for example, with the next little short wave coming through, bringing the snow through the Great Lakes, and the exiting east of that low, which could give us some more snow right here along the coast. But we've discussed that ice storm in pretty good length. Now, as we play through Saturday noon, getting into Saturday evening, snow moving through you know, Ontario and Quebec, and then the next little clipper comes down. Look, both models, good agreement here on Saturday evening pulling into Sunday morning and bringing that snow through Iowa, Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, northern Illinois, or excuse me, southern Wisconsin, northern Illinois. So good timing on this. I, I like the model res uh, simulations here. As we keep playing, guess what? Another clipper comes down on Monday. And the models, as you would imagine, given their skill scores match right now, both finding it. So we see that coming down on Monday. So that one slides on through the GFS a little slower, which is interesting comparatively to the European, which is usually the slower model. And then both models early next week are starting to develop a coastal low right here at the base of that deeper trough. Now this could be returning some rain to some places that desperately need it here in eastern Texas, Oklahoma, and then the lower Mississippi River Valley. Both models take that low and a little bit of difference here. You can see the European keeps it farther to the south in the deeper wave. The GFS ejects it a bit farther to the north. But still, at 120 hours from now to next Tuesday, it's come pretty good agreement in the models. We'll need to see which s solution here, though, uh, probably has this best. I would vote for the European simply because I think the depth of that cold air on this next Arctic high is going to be substantial enough. You can even see how the European model is responding to that. Upslope flow here on the Rockies on, the, on this side of this high. Uh, it's a really strong signal that that high pressure system is quite strong. The difference is the GFS just has it further to the west, or, uh, excuse me, to the east, and therefore it's got a much different trajectory in the storm system to the south as well. But let's keep playing this war. We're through next Tuesday midday into the afternoon, and you can see the difference in the model trajectory. So the GFS taking it farther to the north, the European keeping it much farther to the south and east. The difference is right here. So through the next five to six days, though, we saw a great model agreement. And it's not as though they're necessarily terribly out of agreement on the pattern. Why do I say that? Well, they both bring in the next Arctic high right here through Minnesota by next Tuesday. And so I can't look at that and say, well, you know, maybe the trajectory of this system is a bit off. But overall, through the next five to six days, we're seeing a pretty consistent picture. Now after that, as we play out there into next Thursday, that's when I'm gonna to start to watch for the whole thing to begin to shift around and a much different pattern starting to move in. And you can already see the European hinting at it. Now we're getting a low pressure center a bit farther to the south along the coast. So let's put this together. I'm gonna to talk about total precipitation first. So this was the front that was sliding through right now, that Arctic front. And then what you get here, this is the clipper that rolls through and brings in some snow. We have the snow pushing up in the central Rockies and northern Rockies as well. Now what we're gonna watch early next week, keep your eye right down here, is that coastal low that develops. See it there? While another clipper rolls to the Great Lakes. And the European takes that, tosses it out over open ocean. Not, does not bring it through New England. You do see there's a big area in through here that's not getting anything out of this. And as we play forward through next Wednesday and Thursday, that's when we're watching, again, another clipper coming through, a little bit more snow in the Rockies, there's a large section here in the mid part of the country that's not going to be picking up anything out of this. That's what happens when you have flow that does this, convergence here, dry, that's subsidence in the atmosphere. 
All right, what about the Great Lakes? Real quick, we're at 11.4% ice covered right now, and that's why you saw pretty good lake effect snow. In fact, if we play this on out, this is just accumulating snow in the European model through Monday into Tuesday and Wednesday. That's just played out a week. Got some good lake effect snow here. You can see the corridor for the clippers coming through. This is the snow on the backside of the system exiting tomorrow into Saturday morning, and we're adding up some snow here, right? But the ridge in the west, Sierra Nevada through the Cascades, not picking up a lot. So when does that change? Okay, this is by the time we get to next Wednesday. We saw it in the GFS at the beginning. The European has the same solution. So through next weekend, the 29th, getting to the 30th, into February 1st and 2nd, just like you saw with the GFS, the ridge backs up, intensifies here over um, the Aleutian Islands. Alaska, major shift in temperatures, deep trough dives, and now systems begin to eject right in through this area. Now you'll see that this is a seven day sliding window and I'm showing you right now day four to day 10. Watch how this area, which is in that trough and dry, starts to change as we get out there to include the beginning of the new month. See the shift over? That's what happens when the troughs dig in and eject here. So it appears as though we get into that first week of February, this area is gonna go for active. And the models have been consistent on the timing. Up until this point in the year, I felt like the models were way too early on calling a pattern change. They've been more consistent with this go around. So we'll keep an eye on that. But that would certainly fall in line with what the long range European had been saying for February to look like anyway. From there, let's talk temperatures. That front has made it all the way to the East Coast. This is the 24 hour temperature change map. And look at behind it. Already a major warm up in this area on downslope flow, much warmer temperatures compared to a day ago, while we're 20 to 40 degrees colder than normal. In fact, some places in Texas up to 50 degrees colder than they were just this time yesterday. So that front's moving. Just to show you where it was when I was recorded today, about 4.40 in the afternoon on Thursday, this is what our temperatures were. So still brutally cold air in place here. Now, snow depth. That coldest air is sitting over the top of the snow, but I just want to point out again that right now, looking across the country, we do have a big section here that normally does have some snow on it, like Montana, South Dakota, Wyoming, that doesn't have snow. And just remember, here's our big snow hole of 2022 that has yet to get any decent snows into it. From there, temperatures. There's the highs we saw today, Friday that slides east. As we get into the weekend, we're gonna get some warming conditions here coming off the plains, but really quite cold air occupying from Texas all the way up the east coast and back to the Great Lakes. By the time into Sunday, now look at it. And going from Sunday into Monday, that warmer air really sets up here. But there's another shot at Arctic air coming in on Tuesday and Wednesday of the next week, coming right back through the upper Midwest. This whole time, much of California stays under the ridge and warm. So when does that start to change? Because when we look at what NOAA's talking about in terms of their uh, hazardous temperatures, they do keep till the end of the month the risks for substantially cold air uh, across the east. But I believe it starts to break once we finish this month because the day five through 10 time period from the 12Z GFS and the European looks like it, this as well, we're breaking a pattern here in Alaska and the warmer air is moving a bit with it. That colder air is still entrenched, sorry, that colder air is still entrenched here but look at day 10 through 15. Now things begin to shift back. We start to open up more warmth. The ridges build here and here. So the jet stream pattern does that. And that's the beginning of this new pattern shift. And I think the models have sniffed it out. They're certainly agreeing with each other. It makes sense with what's going on with the MJO, as we talked about, the fading La Nina. And I think this is gonna be a pattern in February we're gonna to have to look out for. My biggest problem with all of this comes back to this map right here. When do we start to erode the drought in the Southern Plains, which continues to grow? That is my major concern as we look forward over the next few months. Well, that and one last thing, the polar vortex. The good news is right now the polar vortex is strong and stable, very steady over the North Pole. And there's no major forecast out there that causes a disruption in this anytime soon. Because remember, the 4th of February last year was the beginning of the truly deep Arctic air that invaded all the way from Siberia to the Gulf of Mexico that caused all the problems in Texas. Our polar vortex this year is quite steady and stable, so we're not gonna see a repeat of that. And with that, I'm gonna wrap it up. Appreciate your attention, thank you.